Good morning. I'm delighted to have been invited to speak to your seminar today. And what I'm going to address is designing more effective public policy to change behaviour and specifically the contribution of behavioural science. Uh, first of all, acknowledgements to some key collaborators, my research team and uh, key funders. And just something about the range of policy work I've done. I do a lot with Department of Health and now with Public Health England, which is uh, the implementation arm um, and cross-government work, especially during the last pandemic influenza outbreak. And internationally, I've worked with the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control and with the WHO. Um, I also gave policy advice to UK's House of Lords Science and Technology Committee when they had a, a year long um, investigation that culminated in a report advising government about what types of behaviour change interventions were most likely to be effective. And I wrote some of this experience up um, in this article called Behaviour Change Theory and Evidence, a presentation to government. Um, and that was in Health Psychology Review. So the importance of behavioural science to policy is increasingly being recognised uh, internationally. So last year we had President Obama in the United States um, giving an executive order about using behavioural insights to better serve uh, the American people. And this was a, an important executive order. We have the uh, EU commissioner saying there is growing recognition that behavioural insights contributing to deliver more targeted and effective policy solutions. And here in the UK, our chief medical officer has recently said it's the behavioural area where we need to stimulate much more work and hopes to fund more evaluations of whether or not different behavioural approaches uh, work in practice. So behavioural science is relevant to several things um, that I'm going to outline uh, today. One is actually in the process itself of engaging policymakers in translating research evidence. Secondly, is in developing and evaluating health promoting policies and interventions. And thirdly, is in implementing evidence into policy and practice. And for each of these, I'm going to give uh, some examples. So two examples that I'll address of practical problems where thousands of lives are lost every year. The first one is hospital acquired infections, uh, where we have specific guidelines for clinical practice, but they're poorly implemented on average on only 40% of occasions. A second one is smoking cessation. Uh, again, smoking related diseases high up there in terms of the global burden of disease um, and mortality. Uh, again, specific guidelines for providing effective uh, behavioural support and poorly in implemented. Um, in our country, we have data on a very large variation uh, between different stop smoking services in the extent to which they are actually basing what they deliver on evidence. So I'm going to argue that we need collaboration and close collaboration between academics and policymakers. Uh, the benefits for policy are that it increases the chance uh, that drawing on evidence will mean that interventions are effective and will make a difference. For research, interactions with policymakers can push researchers to be pretty watertight about their methods and claims when they know it's going to be implemented and potentially make a big difference. And also it does give the opportunity uh, through such a partnership to evaluate interventions and test theories of behaviour change in well-powered ecologically valid, valid studies. So the aim is to develop a cycle, a, posi a positive virtuous cycle between evidence on the one hand and policy and practice on the other. So evidence informs policy and practice and if evaluated correctly, the implementation of policy and practice can then inform uh, the evidence base itself. So um, one can have a really cumulative evidence base building process which becomes more and more uh, attuned to the needs of policymakers. So that's the ideal and I'm going to uh, end with describing one such um, experience of doing this in the UK. 
As I think we all know, collaborations between policymakers and academics do not happen automatically. Because each partner, and this has to be recognised, has their own agendas, their own goals, their own incentive structures. So for success, these need to be aligned with each other. And collaboration is much more likely to be successful if this is recognised and if itself the process draws on insights from behavioural science. We're actually trying to change the behaviour researchers to be more useful to policymakers and the change in policymakers to more effectively draw on research. Um, in my experience, these kind of collaborations benefit greatly uh, from frameworks. And today I'm going to present uh, three frameworks which I think are extremely helpful. Why are they helpful? They help organise thinking and simplify complexity. These are really important things to achieve. They help to facilitate and focus communication. They help to frame research and think about implementation right from the outset. Uh, good frameworks can make evidence and theory accessible, link the theory to evidence, and then link both theory and evidence to policy. And I hope I'll show some of the ways in which frameworks can help in this way. Some useful frameworks. Um, the first is a framework to understand the problem in terms of behaviour in its context. And I'll come back to this, but absolutely key when one's thinking about uh, problems is to think who needs to do what, when, where and how to change this situation in the direction that we'd like. So to identify the people, the key players, identify the key behaviours, how they interact with each other, and to be as precise as possible. The more precise we are, the more likely our interventions are to be effective. And I'm going to present probably what is the most simple model of behaviour. Um, we call it the combi model. Secondly, to consider the full range of effective interventions and supporting policies that could be drawn on to address any particular problem. Very often people draw on something they've read recently, a conversation they've um, had, uh, other interventions they've been involved with. And what happens is if one doesn't have a framework to help a comprehensive approach at the beginning, often potentially effective interventions and policies get missed out. And thirdly, um, a framework for translating general intervention and policy strategies into more specific behaviour change techniques. So first step, understanding the problem in terms of behaviour. Very important to recognise that behaviour is a part of systems. I think we have to use systems thinking at every single le level. So uh, behaviour is a part of a system within ourselves. When we choose to behave in a particular way, it's um, at the expense of a, a different kind of behaviour. It may be facilitated or um, hampered by a behaviour that goes before it. And also a system of behaviours between people, um, within organisations, communities, families, behaviours are inter interdependent between people. And when I uh, meet with policymakers, often the first thing I do is take a very large piece of paper and sit down and draw what I call a conceptual map about who are the key players, what are the key behaviours, what are the types of relationships between these people and these behaviours. Second step is to make what I call a, a behavioural diagnosis of the behaviour in its context. Um, why do we do this? It's in order that we have a good, solid scientific foundation on which to build interventions. If you go to your uh, general practitioner with a medical complaint, you do not want to leave the consulting room without um, knowing that the practitioner has done a careful assessment, formulation and diagnosis of your problem before he hands you a prescription for a drug. Well, it's similarly with policy interventions that are targeting behaviours. We do not want to leap uh, to the solution to interventions without, in the first place, really having done a careful analysis 
of the nature of the behaviour in its context. So whose behaviours? Here we have the example of uh, hand hygiene and what I'm going to say also applies to smoking cessation or indeed any kind of behaviour related to health you care to think about. So here's just a sample. The general population, which includes family and carers. We have health professionals, community workers, service commissioners, providers and planners, employers, key players in industry, national and local government officers, and the list can go on. So very important to think about drawing that big conceptual map, all the potential players, who are key, who do we want to start with? And then for each behaviour that we've identified, we need to think about that behaviour. So behaviour occurs as an interaction between three necessary conditions. So you might just like to think for a moment about what those three necessary conditions are. Uh, the clue is in COM. So one of these conditions starts with C, one with O and one with N. Without three, these three things being in place, behaviour won't happen. So hope you've got it. First is capability. If we don't have the capability to do something, we're not going to do it. But we could have all the capability in the world and the behaviour wouldn't happen unless we also had the opportunity to enact that behaviour. So we need capability and opportunity. But we can have all the capability and the opportunities in the world. It still won't happen if the final piece in the jigsaw, and I hope you've got it, we are not motivated. Uh, to do it. So we absolutely need capability, motivation and opportunity. And as you can see, these are connected by arrows. So this is an example that behaviour is itself a system. An understanding uh, for any particular behaviour that you want to change, whether it's colleagues, whether it's the population, uh, whatever it might be, think about is this a question of shifting the capability and or the motivation and or the opportunity? And by shifting one of these, you can see that it can interact. So, for example, there may be a motivational problem, but we might think, actually, we'll address that, not directly, but through increasing opportunity and capability, which will increase behaviour, have a knock-on effect back onto uh, motivation. So think about... Uh, Back to our academic policy partnership, successful collaboration requires various kinds of capability, the awareness of both needs of policymakers and what academics can offer, an understanding of each other's context in which they work, their concepts and their language. Very important to understand terminology. And skills of communication and partnership building. Motivation. Uh, we need to have our incentives aligned. We need to identify win-win situations, even if our goals are somewhat different. An opportunity. This takes time and organisational structures to allow for the learning and collective thinking. And also, as I said before, the opportunity to identify, well, what are these things which academics and policymakers can jointly uh, benefit from? So moving on now to how to design policy interventions that are likely to be effective. As I've said, we start with understanding the behaviour in context. So we ask why behaviours as they are, but really importantly, what needs to change for the desired behaviours to occur? And now I'm going to get slightly more complicated. So capability can be both psychological, that's knowledge or skills, or physical ability to enact the behaviour. Opportunity can be the physical environment, but also, very importantly, the social environment. And motivation can be uh, what psychologists refer to as reflective or automatic mechanisms that activate or inhibit our behaviour. By reflective, I mean the systematic uh, sort of rational uh, decision making where we weigh up pros and cons and um, come to a, a decision. And we all like to think that uh, that's how we, we behave. But the truth is very different. Um, that very often it's the more automatic mechanisms that influence our motivation, our behaviour. These are emotions, habits, impulses, urges, things that we're often not aware of. And uh, we do need to pay attention to these. 
I'm going to run through uh, some effective principles of behaviour change that has be, have been identified uh, by the National Institute for uh, Clinical and Social Care Excellence. Um, this is an organisation in the UK that's charged with identifying evidence to inform um, the National Health Service, healthcare delivery and also uh, public health. And they looked at the evidence on behaviour change in 2007 and again in 2014 and identified these general principles. And I've grouped them under uh, capability, so maximising capability to regulate our own behaviour. So skills such as goal setting, monitoring feedback, developing sp specific plans to change. Maximising the opportunity uh, to support self-regulation, so eliciting social support, avoiding social and other cues for current behaviours, changing routines and environments, increasing motivation to engage in the desired behaviour, rewarding change, reward a very powerful um, influence on behaviour, developing appropriate beliefs such as belief in the benefits of changing, that other people will approve of the change, how relevant is it to oneself, and very importantly, one's confidence to change. And then developing positive feelings about change. Um, changing beliefs isn't enough. One has to have a change in feelings and emotions also. And then obviously the alternative, reducing the motivation to continue, continue with undesired behaviours. Just say something very briefly about maintaining behaviour change. We could have a whole other talk just on maintaining behaviour change. Um, Changing behaviour is hard, as we all know, but maintaining that change over time is harder still. And maintaining change is what's absolutely needed for a lot of this change to actually translate into health benefits. Very important, don't rely on individual choice and decision making for long term uh, maintenance, but do rely on the environment and making behaviour automatic. So thinking about environmental support and prompts, building routines, giving feedback, and rewards and incentives built into systems. Okay, so moving on. Given our behavioural diagnosis that we've come to by using the COMBI model and thinking what needs to change in terms of these various aspects of capability, opportunity and motivation, what interventions and policies are likely to be effective? Here is a very uh, iconic uh, diagram showing a public health uh, approach. And in the middle here we have individuals with various characteristics of individuals. Round that they, we've got uh, what, what are terms here, lifestyle factors, I don't particularly like that term, but the network of behaviours um, that people are engaged in. Then we have uh, social and community networks of individuals. Round that we've got a variety of different living and working conditions. And surrounding that we have general socio-economic, cultural and environmental conditions. And this is making the very basic point that if we are to understand behaviour and identify effective interventions and policies to change those behaviours, we need to think about people within this context. And the context is uh, multi-layered. Now, nice the organisation I mentioned before, in their review, they found out that uh, to change behaviour, the most effective approaches are when we intervene at many levels simultaneously and consistently. So policies that tackle the individual, the community, the population level. And in, our, in the UK, uh, the most successful um, health policy uh, approach that we've had is the uh, National Comprehensive Tobacco Control Strategy. And importantly, that intervenes at many levels simultaneously, um, from changing the uh, large-scale environment um, to individual services and support. And pitting one versus the other is not the way to go. Multi-level is the way to go. So consider all the options. And what we're looking for to help us do this is a framework that's comprehensive, as I said before, so we don't miss options that might be effective, that's coherent, so we've got a systematic method for intervention development, and that's linked to a model of behaviour change so that we can draw on behavioural science. And importantly, a framework that is usable by and useful to policymakers, service planners and intervention designers. And in my policy work, I was often um, 
shown various frameworks and asked what I thought. And um, they were good in bits and not so good in other bits. So I thought, well, it's an empirical question. What's out there? Let's go and look and see. So we did a systematic literature review, identified 19 frameworks across a lot of different areas, not just health, but environment, culture change, social marketing, etc. But none met, met these three criteria of comprehensive, coherent and linked to a model. So we also noticed that there was a lot of overlap between them and that the overlap seemed to be at two general kinds of levels. So we synthesised these frameworks um, into what we've called the behaviour change wheel. This is published in Implementation Science. If you Google behaviour change wheel, you'll find it. It's open access and the supplementary files uh, show all the frameworks and the steps we took to synthesise them. So what is this? We have put the combi model at the hub. This is where we start. So um, on the left hand side, you see the model as I presented it uh, before. In the middle, the green hub of this wheel is again uh, capability, opportunity and motivation. That's where you start. That's where you do your behavioural diagnosis. And on the basis of that diagnosis, it points to a variety of intervention functions and policy categories that are likely to be effective. So we identified nine intervention functions, restrictions, education, persuasion, incentivization, coercion, training, enable, enablement, modelling and environmental restructuring. And these are all um, defined in the article. Then we identified uh, seven policy categories. These aim to maintain change in the long term. So again, starting from the top, we have guidelines, environmental and social planning, communication and marketing, legislation, service provision, regulation and fiscal measures. And that really summed up uh, what was in those 19 frameworks in a reasonably simple, accessible way where we can link it to doing our behavioural analysis and diagnosis and then point to what's likely to be effective. Um, so in the article, we uh, have got matrices of the different categories of the combi model and given a particular diagnosis, what intervention functions are likely to be effective and then given the intervention functions, what policy categories are likely to be effective. Now, this all probably sounds very complicated. Uh, it's not so complicated, but to make it easier, um, we've, uh, oh sorry, I should just say on the fourth point, after one's identified the intervention functions and policy categories, we've also um, developed ways of linking those with specific behaviour change techniques. So as I was saying, this sounds very complicated. What we have done is uh, written up our experience of running um, probably almost hundreds of workshops, um, training people in the use of this technique into a book called uh, The Behaviour Change Wheel Guide to Designing Interventions. And again, if you Google it, you'll, you'll find this. And alongside uh, the steps that I've taken, there's also another very important bit of work, which is how to think about um, the interventions and policies that are likely to be relevant for your situation. And that requires thinking through a variety of different um, issues, which we have called the APIS criteria. AP standing for affordability, because you can think, OK, here's our intervention strategy. Here's the policy um, that we think are going, is likely to be the most effective, um, but it may not be affordable. So think about affordability. Think about how practical it is in your situation how effective and cost effectiveness, cost effective it is, given what you know of the evidence, how acceptable it is to public, professionals, and also politically acceptable. Are there any side effects, safety questions? And importantly, what are the equity consequences of going down this road? So um, there's one set of steps, which is in theory, in principle, what would be the most um, likely to be effective in terms of particular policies, interventions and techniques. And then out of all of those, which do we select in terms of the APIS criteria? Most of you have probably heard about Nudge and I quite often get asked, where does Nudge fit into all of this? Um, so I'm going to show a couple of slides to uh, demonstrate this. 
So the kind of um, interventions and techniques that are thought of as a nudge in terms of the book um, tend to be environmental restructuring, changing the environment in, in, in ways that will influence behavior, uh, modeling, the sort of role modeling, and um, a variety of types of enablement, which I will um, give examples of in relation to smoking cessation. Uh, so you can see here that this is only three out of nine of the intervention functions. And there are certain things that are absolutely not part of, um, of Nudge. Um, in terms of the policies, tend to be environmental and social planning and communication and marketing. So it excludes things that we know are effective, like financial incentivization in various um, cases, legislation, etc. Um, so you see that it's part of the picture um, and it can be in the right circumstances, these kinds of approaches can be very effective. Um, but it's always important to have the whole picture. Uh, if we think about uh, stop smoking interventions, um, we did some work where we identified uh, particular behavior change techniques that the evidence shows are effective um, for helping people stop smoking. And where did those fit in to the behavior change wheel? So here we have um, advising on stop smoking medication, which is uh, targeting physical capability, facilitating relapse prevention and coping, uh, psychological, advising on uh, changing routines, which is more the automatic motivation, seeking commitment, the reflective motivation. So nicely spread out over the various aspects of the behavioral model. Then the smoking ban and under the counter, which are targeting physical and social opportunities. Um, now, if you look at those, these are all part of what I'd call enablement, which is service provision, all coming under the behavioural support, and part of environmental restructuring, which is underpinned by the policy of legislation. So these things aren't uh, necessarily nudge. So I would say go with the comprehensive framework, go with the evidence uh, rather any, than any uh, particular um, slice of that. Okay, now I want to go on to a couple of um, concrete examples of interventions. Uh, building on the examples I gave at the beginning of this talk. So the first I want to talk about is the Clean Your Hands campaign. Um, as I said before, a big problem throughout the world about what one would think is a fairly straightforward behaviour uh, to wash one's hands with soap or alcohol hand rub gel. Poorly implemented. So first of all, think about in an institution, which behaviours? Whose behaviours? So we have nurses and doctors, obviously. But we also have the infection control nurses. Are they conducting audits and feedbacking the results in the way they should? And then the staff responsible for distributing, for example, alcohol hand rub. Um, the dispensers aren't any use if they don't actually contain alcohol hand rub. And there are many, many more uh, people and behaviours that are important here. Um, we thought about the intervention in terms of uh, combi. What needs to change? So we identified, this was a national campaign, um, we identified opportunity. So part of the campaign was to get alcohol hand rub beside every bed, so everybody's got the opportunity. The motivation, there were persuasive posters that were designed uh, by individual hospitals that were changed around quite regularly. Capability, uh, getting health professionals to pay attention to their behaviours, set goals for themselves and develop action plans when they weren't achieving their goals in this regard. And just very quickly um, to show you the intervention that was based on a theory of behaviour, it's called control theory and I haven't got time to go into it, but really to demonstrate that this was a national effective campaign uh, which based the uh, intervention and the, on um, COMBI and then drew on psychological theory, especially to target capability. So here, targeting capability, we had um, every month we had two members of staff being observed. Uh, they were given immediate verbal feedback. Um, if they had uh, cleaned their hands appropriately in the opportunities in which they should have, they're given a certificate. If they weren't, they were given immediate um, goal setting, action planning, and then they were observed again uh, within the next period. So this was done at an individual level and then also done at a ward level. So again, every month 
uh, one group of staff members were observed and then the feedback was displayed uh, in the wards and discussed at ward meetings um, and the both of these uh, were, were ongoing and set up to be sustainable within the healthcare system in that um, these observations were car carried out by infection control nurses. Um, we, and this speaks to evaluation. If we just introduced this without any evaluation, we'd have had no idea uh, whether this worked or not. We'd have known that we were developing it on the basis of evidence of what works, on the basis of behavioural science theories. We wouldn't have known what, whether it worked. So we used what's a step, called a stepped wedge design where we intervened at different times in uh, 16 hospitals and 60 wards, collecting data throughout. And um, the results were that use of soap and alcohol hand rub tripled um, in the intervention hospitals and rates of the uh, hospital acquired infections decreased. And giving the one-to-one -one feedback led to staff being between 13 and 18% more likely to clean their hands. So this was a, a multi-level behavior change uh, intervention that um, was effective. So direct implications for policy. Here's some evidence base that can inform policy. The behavior change wheel has been used for many different uh, types of behavior in many different uh, countries and settings. So uh, not time to read this, but really this is just to show you um, that it's, it's uh, been very widely applied. And it's been used in various ways. Um, we really developed it to help uh, design interventions and policies. But what the UK uh, government is doing um, quite commonly is to use it to what I call retrofit, which is to look at their current interventions and policies and to think, where does that fit into the behaviour change wheel? Are there things missing? Are we missing a trick here? If there are things missing, is that for a good reason? Did we consider it and then decide, well, actually there wasn't the evidence or it didn't meet the appeals criteria or did we just never consider it? And it's been found to be very helpful um, in that way. Also been used to structure systematic reviews of evidence and provide a framework for conducting evaluations. So in terms of evaluation, um, I really can't stress enough how important evaluation is. Evaluation can translate ongoing activity into useful evidence. Um, and it often doesn't take a lot to introduce a design. So for example, the case I just presented, uh, we could have just introduced it to all the hospitals um, and wards simultaneously. And you know, we could have had a before and after design very weak because we wouldn't have known, well, was that just because other things had changed as other things always do change. But by systematically doing it uh, at different times um, and randomly across these different wards, we were able to, to generate publishable evidence. So, absolutely vital to accumulate evidence that's going to be useful to us and to other people. Um, really important to plan evaluation advance. Um, it really makes me weep often when I'm brought in to say, please help us evaluate, but the opportunity is gone because the intervention has started. So do get academic partners involved right at the first stage about thinking about um, the intervention and the policy and plan in advance. We can um, use evaluations, not just to find out, is it effective, um, but also for whom? What are the reasons for variation? Answer the question. What is it that works for whom, in what settings, and how does it work? What are the mechanisms of action? I said at the beginning, what we're really trying to achieve is this good two-way interaction between evidence and policy and practice. And I want to uh, finish about talking about an example from the UK, the National Centre for Smoking Cessation and Training that I uh, helped to set up. I was um, co-director of it and I'm now their uh, scientific advisor. Uh, so th this is the, the website. As you can see, it uh, does training, research and also uh, delivery. And what it was very much set up to do was uh, to investigate how we can get the best possible evidence, put it into practice, investigate that practice in order to strengthen the evidence base. So here I've sum summarised, we've looked at the ev evidence. What are the behaviour change techniques that work in relation to behavioural support for smoking cessation? 
how does that translate into the kind of professional competencies that need to be reflected both in terms of training and manuals? Um, in terms of the techniques we've uh, used, uh, behavioural change technique taxonomy, uh, this is work I and colleagues actually over 400 uh, behaviour change experts from all over the world were involved over several years developing this. And this is 93 behaviour change techniques that can be used to characterise um, interventions. If anybody's interested, this is Annals of Behavioural Medicine in 2013, um, or a very keen PhD student of mine developed a smartphone app. So uh, both on uh, iPhones or on Androids, you can just download this um, search for BCT, standing for behaviour change techniques. And as you can see, the techniques are um, grouped into various categories uh, within this. So which are most effective for smoking cessation? When we set up the training centre, this national training centre, we looked at the evidence. We looked at randomised control trials in the Cochrane reviews, which are gold standard literature reviews. We also looked at observational evidence that were being collected throughout the UK on uh, four week quit rates in the stop smoking services. Identified the behaviour change techniques um, that were associated with effectiveness and identified eight core ones that both had good evidence but were also identified as important by experts. And those eight core were the basis of this national training programme. Uh, and these are the eight core ones, again grouped under capability, facilitating barrier identification and problem solving, relapse percent prevention and coping, goal setting and advising on stop smoking medication. So these were training capabilities. Then uh, motivation, providing information on the consequences of smoking and smoking cessation, and providing feedback by uh, monitoring carbon monoxide levels. Opportunity was giving options for additional and later support. And then there were the general role, providing information on uh, withdrawal symptoms. Um, so the training was set up based on uh, those key behaviour change techniques, there were quite a lot of others, and, and do go to the um, website to look up more about this if you're interested. It's the National Centre for Smoking Cessation and Training. But we wanted to find out, is this actually working in practice? We've looked at the evidence of what works, we've trained all the um, stop smoking advisors, and now are they delivering what they've been trained in? You have to follow through to see is this working. Uh, so we, we thought, let's look at the level of behaviour change technique. Are they delivering it as we um, expected them to? And what's the quality of how well they're delivering it? And uh, my colleague, uh, Fabi Lauren Cato, has published several papers um, reporting this. And the results of that work can then be fed back into the training programme, where we see that there are behaviour change techniques that aren't being um, delivered or are being delivered poorly, we can then adjust the training programme. So this is an example of a two-way, um, almost a sort of behavioural science laboratory. And I think that's the kind of thing we want to be building. Um, close, this is a close collaboration between policymakers of the Department of Health and now Public Health England and with academics. So in conclusion, I know I've covered a lot of ground and I hope you've uh, followed it. Um, but my main conclusions are that behavioural science is at the heart of health promotion and also implementation of evidence into practice. That I think to develop effective policy and to implement that policy into practice, collaborations between academics, including behavioural scientists and policy makers are necessary. We do need to bring these two worlds much more closely together. And thirdly, successful collaborations require motivation, opportunity, and training of capabilities in behavioural science and in evidence-based policy. And at all levels within and across countries. And I would like to see um, governments supporting organisations that are specifically tasked with this kind of work. I think it would pay off many times over. And I'll just finish uh, saying something about the UCL Centre for Behaviour Change, which I direct. Um, this was set up and uh, its main mission is to bring expertise across different academic disciplines that are relevant to behaviour and behaviour change, because no one discipline um, has, all got, has got all the answers. 
and secondly, to translate that academic expertise to the outside world, um, whether it's uh, policy makers in the public sector, whether it's uh, NGOs or industry. Um, and we do this through a variety of training, um, research, consultancy and um, events and, and do look at the website where there's a host of resources. You can sign up to um, get our emails about what's going on. Here are some of the resources. I mentioned the Behaviour Change Wheel Guide, also a guide to development and evaluation of digital behaviour change interventions. Uh, we've published a book on um, behaviour change theories and also about uh, thinking about behaviour change across disciplines. And finally, uh, very excited about uh, this coming year, we're launching what I think is probably the world's first interdisciplinary MSc in behaviour change, where we are welcoming people from all backgrounds, all academic disciplines and all types of jobs, both uh, full and part time. So uh, do spread the word and I look forward to answering your questions shortly. Thank you.